are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. Today's topic is all about Venus retrograde, which happens every so often, and it's time for another one. So I thought we'd look at it in depth, even though I'm sure we touched on it, or I would believe we probably touched on it in the 2017 overview, which was the 2016 December episode of Looking Up, in case you're looking back to look up. Anyway, today I am wearing a combination of red and purple. Huh. If I was a younger woman, I would have scoffed at such a thing. You know, in the crayon box, they're probably far apart. Let's say this, on the color spectrum, they are at opposite ends. Ultraviolet and infrared. Anyway, if you bend the color spectrum into a circle, they're right next to each other because purple is really a blend of red and blue. Now, why am I wearing purple and red today? Many times I try to match my outfit to the topic. You may or may have not noticed that or I may or may not have mentioned that. And don't expect that I'm going to do it every time. But this time it's because Venus in its upcoming retrograde will go backwards from the sign of Aries, symbolized by red, into the sign of Pisces, symbolized by purple. So that's why I have them, because you know, signs next to each other do not have anything in common, but <clears throat> except for proximity. <laughs> so when planets shift from one sign to another, it's always our opportunity to change our behavior into a different direction. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today on Looking Up. So, first of all, let's talk about what is the function of Venus, because each planet represents a drive common in human behavior. So we all have the drive to love and be loved. We all experience attractions, and we all have a need to evaluate, assess, assign value to something. Venus is related to values. It's related to money, which is one of the things that we value. But maybe we don't value it so much as money itself as what money can accomplish and do for us. That being said, I will say I have long had a fantasy to have a portrait done a la Annie Leibovitz's picture of Bette Midler in the bathtub full of roses. I wanted to be in a bathtub full of Ben Franklin $100 bills, but that's just me. Anyway, money, you know, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And that's from the old saying, and I guess it's from the Bible, I'm not sure. Anyway. So Venus's function is to draw us towards something and to please us with our senses and to bring beauty into life. Now, any planet expresses its drive or its function through the sign that it's moving through. So that's why when you're born with, say, Venus in Aries, you express your desire to go after your heart's wishes in a different way than a person who was born with Venus in Pisces. So it's like it flavors how we go after or how we express that drive or urge. So <clears throat> 
Venus has a very interesting cycle. It's probably the most interesting of any of the planets. And because it is the second rock from the sun and we are the third rock from the sun, we are always watching it and measuring its motion while we're moving too. Well, that's true with all the planets. And that's what accounts for the phenomenon called retrograde, which is an optical illusion because actually all the planets are proceeding forward through the zodiac, or no, forward through the sky, around the sun. The zodiac is like the backdrop, the measuring stick, the racetrack that we look at the planets and decide how they seem to be moving to us and therefore how they seem to be affecting us. So when a quicker planet passes us, it looks like it goes backwards. Or when we're the quicker planet and we pass a slower planet, it looks like it goes backwards. So it's just a trick of the eye, but it's a phenomenon that ex we experience as if it's real to us. So what happens is, you know, we're on Earth, the sun's between, well, let's say, Venus is between us and the sun. So we see Venus come exactly between the sun and us. That, well, we can't see Venus because it's blocked by the sun's bright light, but we can measure and know where it is. That's what's called the inferior or interior conjunction coming together of Venus and the sun from our viewpoint. So then it goes around to the far side. And oh, we can't see it then either because the sun's light again is blocking us out, but we measure, we know it's there. That's called the superior conjunction of Venus and the sun. It neither is inferior or superior in a evaluation sense. It's just interior and exterior. They could have used those words anyway. So what's happening is in between that, we see it coming out to the side. Well, when we see it coming out to the side, it gets to a very far point from our viewpoint, from the sun, that's called its maximum elongation. And it comes around and it comes back to the other side and it has another maximum elongation. Well, it hangs out at those far points for months. It's very quick when it comes between us and the sun. It's a little longer that it lingers when it's on the outside of our viewpoint. And this also still has to do because we're moving along with it. Okay, so the whole cycle, if you measure from that point where Venus is exactly between Earth and Sun to the next time it gets there, and of course we've moved too, 584 days, of which it appears to be invisible for about 10 days when it's between us and the sun, maybe even a little less. And I think longer than that when it's on the far side. Right. And the actual time it looks like it's going backwards in the zodiac, which is what we call retrograde from the Latin words for backward step or movement, is 40 days. Well, we see 40 a lot of times in the Bible, you know, 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus wandered in the wilderness and Oh, I don't remember if Noah had rain for 40 days and 40 nights. But anyway, there's some 40s in there. And I don't know if that relates to this Venus retrograde, possibly. But the 40 days is something we see happening, you know, like clockwork. And when it's hanging out on that elongated, elongated on either side, it's out there for six to seven moon cycles or months. We usually see the crescent moon near the evening star seven times when Venus is an evening star. And we see the late moon called the balsamic or the waning crescent moon seven times when it's the morning star. And what's most interesting, well maybe most interesting, is when Venus gets ready to go retrograde, like you've been seeing it every night in the night sky, bright as can be. People think it's the headlight of a plane coming into land. People say, Janet, what's that bright star out there? I go, that's Venus. She's just as bright in the morning, but I don't usually see her then because you have to get up before dawn for that. But sometimes there's, you know, a middle of the night trip to the bathroom and you see it then. Anyway, I should speak for us older people. 
That doesn't happen to you young folks. Anyway, <clears throat> it's high in the sky after sunset at the evening star during that elongated phase. Then night after night, we see it not getting quite as high, not getting quite as high, not getting quite as high. Then it seems like it's gone. It drops really fast when it's ready to go retrograde, or actually it's probably already started to go retrograde. And then it disappears. It has that inferior conjunction with the sun, and a week or so later, pops up as the morning star. And when it pops up ahead of the sun, called the heliacal rise, the rise ahead of the sun, it is the brightest that it ever is because it is the closest to Earth. Now, it's shifted at that point to morning star, evening star. So each one of these conjunctions with the sun shifts its phase. The exterior one shifts to uh, evening star, and the interior one shifts to morning star. Now, it seemed to some of the ancients, before they understood, you know, planetary motion, which we really only got down in the time of Kepler, and that's what, maybe the 1600s, 1700s? I think it was the 16, well, around then. See, I'm not a historian. Well, before that, they almost thought it was two different planets. The morning Venus, the evening Venus. They called the evening Venus Hesperus, which had a root word similar to West, even though Hesp doesn't sound like West to me, but at any rate, that's the root. And the morning star was called the light bringer because it was so bright, and that name was Lucifer. Well, now you look to Christianity, and Lucifer is one of the names for the devil. And Really, Lucifer was the fallen angel. Lucifer was God's favorite, but Lucifer tried to be too much like God and therefore fell from grace. Well, Venus is the brightest object in the night sky or twilight sky other than the moon. The moon's our satellite, but it is the brightest thing out there as far as how much of the sun's light does it reflect back to us. And that's because it has a very gassy atmosphere, so it really reflects a lot of light. That percentage of light that it reflects is called the albedo, if you're looking for a new word in your vocabulary, A-L-B-E-D-O. Well, until we discovered iris, it was the highest albedo at around, I don't know, 71% or something um, of all of the planets that orbit the sun. Now, then we discover Eris, and if you look up the mythology of Eris, she started trouble by taking this golden apple that had been given to, I think, Hera by Gaia, but she stole it. She inscribes it for the fairest and kind of bowls it into this wedding she hadn't been invited to, and a big fight breaks out between Hera and Athena and Aphrodite as to who's the fairest of them all. The ironic thing is, is that Eris, now that we've discovered it astronomically, is the fairest of them all because it's so frozen, it's just all ice, and its albedo is, I don't know if it's 90% or something, it's even higher than Venus. But as far as we know, and what we can see without telescopes, with our naked eye, Venus is the brightest thing of all. So, for us, it's like the shiny object. Again, what we're attracted to. What do we wish on at the evening star? What do we usually wish about? Something that will make us happy. Maybe it's love, maybe it's money, maybe it's something else that we want. But it's all about desire, and that's the function of Venus. So, about every 1.6 years, Venus has one of these retrogrades, and lasts, like I said, for 40 days. This year's retrograde starts on March 4th, which now I find kind of ironic because I remember reading in a riddle book and it said, what's the only day of the year that's a command? And the answer was March 4th, like, you know, go forward. And this is when Venus is gonna start going backwards. So that's a little ironic. But then 40 days after that, when Venus stops being retrograde, will be income tax day, April 15th. And you know, a Mercury retrograde starts April 9th. And that's why there's this little 
sliver there in the middle of April from the 9th to the 15th with both Mercury and Venus retrograde, the planet of information, the planet of money. Do you want to wait till the tax deadline to file this year? No, you do not. And if you receive my blogs, you would already know that, but it's not too late to sign up and you can go to astrologybooth.com and go to the blog booth and see the blog about that. And at the bottom of any page, you can sign up to be a regular receiver of my blogs. Anyway, so Venus is marching up to 13 degrees of Aries, and then it's going to back down to 2655. We might as well call that 27 of Pisces, and then come forward again. Now, one of the things that that kind of means, if we were going to interpret its message or its lesson, it says, we came through Pisces, we were inspired, we had a vision, we made a prayer, we had compassion in some way. Then we go into Aries. We want to take what we had gained going through Pisces and put it into action. Aries is a sign of do something, go forward, advocate for what you want. I hate to say fight because we do way too much fighting. But Venus and Aries a little bit likes a good fight or let's say enjoys a good debate. Then when it goes backwards, it says, you know what? I'm getting a little too pushy. I'm getting, or I'm getting ahead of myself. I've gone too fast. I've forgotten some of this vision or passion or compassion that I had from Pisces. I better go back and fetch that and then come forward and try again with doing what I want to do. So that's kind of what we're going through in this back and forth between Aries and Pisces. Now, another thing I thought was very interesting, and you may have noticed this if you have a really good eye and it's not too much ambient light or what we call light pollution, where you have been sky watching, but Venus was getting very close to Mars. If you looked a little bit up to the left of where Venus was, was this smaller, not as bright, but obvious and noticeable red dot Mars. And so Mars also in Aries, the sign that it rules. And Venus coming closer, but it doesn't quite get there. Then it starts doing its drop back and it won't actually get together with Mars until the October 5th full moon this fall. So you may also find that in business partnerships, deals, uh, perhaps we find this in international diplomacy because contracts and uh, treaties are ruled by Venus or its sign of Libra. But maybe we come close to what it is we're going after. We feel it, we see it, we taste it, it's right in front of us, and then something happens that we don't quite get there. And it's going to take us a long road. And they're going to be morning stars when they finally get together in October just barely far enough from the sun that we should be able to see it. Well, get up early that morning and see. And you know, it's interesting too. When it's a full moon, as the sun sets, the moon rises. But the reverse is true. So as the sun rises, the moon sets. So when you get up pre-dawn to look for Mars and Venus around the 3rd, 4th, 5th, or whatever, of October, you'll see them very close together as the moon is setting. So. One of the things I wanted to mention is the nature of Venus in these two signs because Venus is very happy in Pisces. It's said to be exalted in that sign, working very well. And I think that's because it is planet of love and Pisces is a sign of non-judgment and unconditional love, universal love. Aries, on the other hand, is the opposite sign to Libra, one of the signs that Venus rules. It rules two signs, Taurus and Libra. So when a planet is in the sign opposite what it rules, it's in what's called detriment. And that's where it sounds detrimental. Doesn't work so good there. Why? Because 
This is a self-oriented sign, Aries. It's me, me, me. But Venus is about us. It's about you. And so the us and you doesn't work so good with the me, me, me. There's competition. Okay. So some of the things that Venus is doing while it's going back and forth in the lead up to the backup, in the backup, and in the coming out of the backup. So there's two periods before and after when it goes through the range of degrees that it actually backtracks through. And sometimes we call this the shadow. So in that case, we would say the shadow of the Venus retrograde began on January 30, 30th. Okay, And it comes out of that shadow not until May 18th. So that's about three and a half months that it's in this one part of the zodiac in about a 15 or so, 16-ish degree range. And it's very concentrated. So wherever that range is in your chart, that's where you have a lot going on in your life for this winter into spring. So we know that Saturn is going through Sagittarius and getting towards the high degrees. And Sagittarius is a sign that's 90 degrees with Pisces. And so we have what's called the square. Venus made its first square to Saturn just before it went into its retrograde range. So that would have been on the 27th of January. It will make two exact squares, one while retrograde on April 8th, and then coming out of the retrograde on April 21st. And Saturn, it's like putting on the brakes, or it says, let's get everything organized, ship shape, squared away. And it might be times around which you feel like, ooh, I gotta tighten my belt, I gotta be careful with my money, or I'm making a money plan, or I need to set boundaries like Saturn's rings in my relationships. All of those things are appropriate with a square to Saturn. And that is the most difficult connection or aspect, we call it, that Venus is making during this retrograde back and forth. Now, the um, one thing it does three times during its actual retrograde range is what's called a semi-sextile, it means 30 degrees, one sign apart exactly, from Neptune, ruler of Pisces, which is one of the signs it's backing up, back and forth with. So it did the first one on 222, the second one, oh no, yes, second one is March 14th, and the third one is May 19th. By that time, I think Venus has maybe gone just barely outside of its retrograde range. So actually, it's not really doing three repeats of anything this time around. And sometimes it doesn't because other planets are moving during that time. It's not like they all stand still and wait for Venus to hit them. But the semi-sextile is mildly positive and it kind of adds to that Piscean undertone because Neptune is going through Pisces also. And we would find that this kind of tilts the scale a little bit towards the compassion, art, inspiration, prayer, positive visualization that Venus is doing in this particular retrograde cycle. Now, I wanted to mention how that shifting point between Aries and Pisces is very strategic and important part of the zodiac because zero, the beginning of Aries, is considered the beginning of the zodiac and it's the first degree of spring. And so um, 29 Pisces, the final degree from 29 to 30, or which is zero Aries, is the final degree of zodiac and it's considered to be the most difficult degree or maybe the most karmically related or a degree of suffering. And so we find that Venus going through this degree three times, it may bring some sense of victimization or, hmm, if you think about Venus as being monetary support, it may bring more monetary support to victims. So we th see things like, you know, the GoFundMe for the Indian families of the 
fellow in the Midwest who shot somebody, it seems like it was a hate crime, they'll probably call it that. Okay, uh, another key point is going to be March 18th when Mercury and Venus are together. And that's a big time for saying what you need to say about what you feel is most important. And that takes place in Aries, about nine degrees. And so it will be very outspoken. So watch and see what things are in the news because Mercury also rules the news or, or what's on the lips of everybody around March 18th. Another thing that I think is important about that zero Aries, 29 Pisces, I remember back in 2003, that's exactly when we went into the Iraq invasion that started that war. And we went in when the sun was crossing through 29 Pisces. And I thought, geez, if we just wait one day, we'd probably have a better experience in that war. If you're going to go to war, do it in the war sign, Aries, at the zero degree, the power point. But of course, the next day, the inspections were going to stop and prove that there were no weapons of mass destruction like our government lied us into. But at any rate, here what happened at that same strategic point of the zodiac, after one week in office, Donald Trump sent that failed mission into Yemen, and Mars was at zero Aries when he went in. And it was probably at 29 Aries when they were in the final stages of um, planning that. So, as Venus goes through this, Venus is not generally considered a, a war's planet, but the Mayans, who based a lot of their astronomy and astrology on Venus, considered that heliacal rise of Venus the morning star as the warrior signal. It's time to go to war. So I wanted to just read to you, or just consult for a second in my Janet's Planets, about when it's there. Okay, um, Venus at the 29 degree. Well, 2nd and 3rd of February, 2nd to the 5th of April, 25th to the evening of the 25th to the morning of the 28th of April. So watch that near the beginning and end of April about if we do anything hasty because Aries is all about, you know, rush and leap before looking, duh. I also wanted to mention a wonderful book that you might be interested in looking at called Venus Star Rising by Ariel Gutman. She's going to be our speaker at the Astrological Society of Connecticut in March for a lecture and a workshop. Let's see, the third Thursday of March is the lecture. That's, I think, the 16th and maybe the 18th for the workshop. I should give you the right dates. Okay, yeah, the 16th and the 18th. This is about where Venus was morning star or evening star in its cycle before you were born, and you have your a certain sign that applies to you for life about that. And it might not be your sun sign or your Venus sign. So fascinating stuff for you to look up there. There's only five signs currently that the Venus retrograde can occur in. Aries is one of them, Gemini, Leo, Scorpio, and Capricorn. And those signs shift over the course of time, but it takes, I don't know, a little over a hundred years for each of those signs to be a location for the retrograde. So anyway, I want you to figure out what's most important for you. Go after it, but remember to do it with compassion along with your action and passion. And that's how you work with the planets on Looking Up. Mm -hmm.